we continue. And so we continue on the uh, foundation of uh, parametric nonlinear optics. So my lecture uh, will be voluntary, complementary to that given by Bob, in the sense where I put some uh, equations, my objective, uh, more equation than in, in the talk of, uh, of Bob, my objective being to uh, give you uh, the calculation tools for nonlinear optics. So a lot of uh, slides and equations. I am not going to detail uh, all these equations. So it's just to give you uh, the sequence of the main step in, in, uh, in calculations. OK, so here is the outline of my talk. I will begin with the interest of parametric generation, then the fundamentals, and I will end by the main uh, interactions. Uh, let's begin with the interest of uh, parametric uh, optics. And with this simple uh, table I published a long time ago in uh, a Wille uh, Encyclopédie. Uh, so you have at the top the wavelength uh, range from UV to mid and the beginning of uh, far infrared, and then the applications. And so you see the different applications uh, requiring uh, coherent and intense, or not intense, but coherent uh, light. So uh, you have uh, semiconductors, machining, optical storage, uh, telecom, material machining, surgery, laser fusion, uh, communication in the atmosphere, and obviously spectroscopy. So you see that we need uh, uh, there is a, a strong need of, uh, of wavelength. If now we look at the existing laser uh, sources, um, so, okay, we have excimers in the UV, neodymiag around one micron, CO2 lasers, diodes, dyes, argon, tie sapphire, and so on. Uh, so, okay, there exists for some wavelength or at same for given level of energy or or time domain, uh, but we see that we cannot cover the whole spectrum uh, of uh, the whole electromagnetic uh, spectrum. And so, and you know, you know that, by combining uh, these uh, laser sources with, so here it's only by refrigeration crystals, but you know that we have also uh, fibers, uh, and, not be re and, and crystals that are not birefringent. So by combining, in general, nonlinear media with laser sources, we can extend the spectral range of, uh, of the laser sources. So I mentioned here different uh, oxi uh, oxide and calcoparides, and you see that it's possible, for example, by combining the neodymia laser with lithium noibate, for example, you can uh, build uh, an OPO, we are going to see that, and generate uh, over uh, the near, uh, uh, near infrared uh, spectrum. Okay. So now let's move on fundamentals. And we are going to begin with uh, the constitutive relation relative to electric field. So when the light intensity is typically uh, uh, great of, uh, of the order of one megawatt per square centimeter, uh, uh, so typically uh, using a laser, uh, we can observe a nonlinear uh, phenomenon. And uh, if we don't uh, exceed uh, too much, uh, a too big intensity, typically a few hundred of, of gigawatt per square centimeters, we can uh, use uh, the uh, perturbative approach. Uh, and Bob uh, discussed this point uh, uh, this morning. And we uh, can write the electronic polarization, uh, expand this electronic polarization in a Taylor power series of the applied electric field. So the applied electric field is the electric field of the incident light. And so the, this electronic polarization, so here written as a function of time, can be written like this. P0 is the static polarization. 
so at a frequency equal to zero. Uh, and P1, P2, P3 is a first order, second order, and third order uh, electronic polarization. And so and I'm, I'm not going to, 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 to go in details for uh, these equations, but what is important to see here is that it is given by these uh, integrals over uh, time. And uh, first point, you see here that for P2, P3, uh, and so on, if I had uh, more place, you see here that we have the product of field. So just by writing this, we see that we can, we have the door open for the interaction between el different electric fields uh, of light. And uh, the other, but not for P1. So P1, you see that P1 is only proportional to one electric field. Uh, so it will be the distinction between the linear optics and nonlinear optics. And the other important, important point uh, here is this R1, R2, R, R3. So these are tensors. So I will give you more details tomorrow uh, during my lectures on uh, tensors and symmetries. Uh, but for the moment, just know uh, that uh, we have tensors. Uh, and so here, this sign, dot, two dot, three dots, and these are tensorial uh, operators. And I will uh, give you some, um, uh, some more details uh, tomorrow. OK. Uh, so we are discussing about parametric Nonlinear optics. It means interaction between different Fourier components of the optical fields. And uh, for that, it's necessary to write the equations as a function of uh, the circular frequency. And so a good tool for that, as you know, is uh, the uh, Fourier uh, transform. You know that uh, there is a relationship between the wave packet F of t and the Fourier components f of uh, omega, where f can be e or p and so on. And so, uh, because the fields are uh, real, we have these uh, uh, important relations between the complex conjugate of the field at omega and the field at minus uh, omega. Okay, so putting this in uh, the, uh, the previous equations uh, allows us to uh, define uh, the uh, component of the electric susceptibility as a function of the frequency. So chi 1, chi 2, and so on. And so uh, here they are given by these, uh, these integrants. And which is very interesting here and important, you see that it appears omega 1 plus or minus omega 2. Okay, so we know that by doing this, that we are going to make some sum or difference of frequency uh, generation. OK, and so from that, it's easy to uh, write uh, the electronic polarization as a function of omega. And so you have here the uh, uh, the first, second, and third order electronic polarization uh, for the Fourier component uh, omega. And you see explicitly here, so it's, the, the, this writing is very interesting because you see that you can have interaction between, in the case of pi 2, between two electric fields, one at omega 1 and the other one at plus or minus omega 2, and for pi 3 omega-3 plus or minus omega-4 plus or minus omega-5. It is a fundamental, the, the constitutive equation of nonlinear optics. OK, second uh, step. So we just saw uh, the constitutive equations. So now the Maxwell equations, when we are interested in the propagation of uh, the light uh, in, uh, in matter. So in a non-conducting and non-magnetic media, so you have these four uh, equations. So take care. So here E and H 
are the electric field and magnetic field of the light, and D and B, so the electric displacement given here by this expression, and B, the magnetic induction, uh, deals with the, uh, the matter, uh, the uh, electronic polarization of, uh, of matter. So you know very well these, uh, these equations, but now we, we are all interested in having uh, such equations in the spectral uh, domain. And uh, so for that, so it's not so uh, difficult to do that. You see that but by uh, explicitating uh, the field, exponential uh, minor, uh, exponential j omega uh, t, you see that by derivating according to uh, the time, you have minus j omega uh, that appears. And you can obtain the Maxwell equations relative to each Fourier component of the uh, optical field uh, and with p omega given here by this uh, Taylor uh, series. Okay, so now just for uh, summarizing uh, the, 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 the things, so you can forget the equations and uh, keep in mind this, uh, this scheme, which uh, I call the algorithm uh, of the interaction between light and matter. So with two, two steps. Uh, so he, uh, the polarization of matter and the propagation of light. So the story begins with the excitation field. So you have an incident beam, E and A, characterized by uh, the electric field and magnetic field. And so the first step of this algorithm is the polarization of matter. That is to say, uh, you uh, uh, modify the uh, orbitals, the uh, electronic orbitals of uh, matter. We are going to see that uh, later on. And so, uh, and so that you create a polarization in the matter characterized by the electric displacement and the magnetic uh, field. And this is governed by the constitutive equations. And the so second step, all these, uh, these dipoles, uh, created dipoles, now are going to emit light. Uh, and on E and H on right here correspond to the electric and magnetic fields of the radiated uh, light. And, um, and this is governed by the propagation equation. So excitation, polarization of matter, propagation of light corresponding to the emission to, uh, of, of the dipoles. And the, uh, yes, emission of the dipoles. And this emitted light uh, can constitute an excitation for the next part of matter. And typically, and so this can come here, it becomes an excitation field, and so on, and so on, and so on. And the typical the interaction length of this uh, algorithm is typically the wavelength, so typically the, the, the micron. So here I uh, wrote the electric displacement at omega, and you see two parts here, the linear uh, part, the, the, the part governing linear optics, so epsilon zero E omega plus P one uh, omega. Uh, so only one Fourier component is involved, and you see here uh, in this part, P two, P three, and P four, and so on, the uh, nonlinear part of the electric displacement, and we know now, according to the previous uh, the, the equations I uh, showed it you, we know that we have the possibility to have interactions between sev several Fourier components of, uh, of the field. Okay, so now a classification uh, of all these processes. Um, so I'm going to speak about three wave uh, process or three photon process and four photon uh, uh, pr processes. 
Uh, and in a corpuscular uh, picture, so I, I am not going to make uh, quantum optics, so to, to, to put the equations of quantum optics, so Bob will do that uh, after tomorrow and other uh, people uh, too, but it's just the picture uh, using the notion of, uh, of photon. And uh, what is very uh, interesting in nonlinear optics is that you absolutely need the quantum uh, aspect to fully understand the things, which is not necessarily the case uh, for linear optics, even if you can make quantum optics in linear optics, obviously. But for a deep understanding of nonlinear optics, you need this quantum uh, approach. So, uh, First, so I, I, I'm I will begin with three photon processes. You can see that like a fusion of two photons. Uh, so these two photons are drawn here, one at omega one, the other one at omega two. They interact with the chi two uh, medium and it gives rise uh, to a higher energy photon at, uh, at omega three. Uh, you have here, so you saw this morning, this uh, energy level uh, diagram. Uh, and so here, uh, for upper uh, arrow correspond to the incident photons and down arrow to the generated uh, photons. And so we have obviously energy conservation, omega one plus omega two equal uh, omega three. Uh, and we, have <clears throat> we can have an optimization of this process if momentum conservation is fulfilled, that is to say K1 plus K2 equal uh, K3. Okay, so it's the first. So this, this process of uh, uh, fusion uh, of two photons correspond to some frequency generation you have generated at omega 3 equal omega 1 plus uh, omega 2. Okay, the second one is the exact reverse of the fusion. It is the spontaneous splitting of one photon at omega-3 into two lower energy photons at omega-1 and uh, omega-2. Uh, so you have the corresponding here uh, energy level diagram. And obviously, we have the two same uh, uh, conservations equation for the energy and for the momentum than for the photon uh, fusion. So now we continue on splitting, on, on the splitting of uh, one photon into two, uh, but here we see that we can have a stimulation, we can uh, stimulate the process using uh, here, I put a stimulation on the mode omega-1. So omega-1 is one of the two modes. Yes, sorry. So here, these two uh, constitute, uh, which we call a, a pair of photons, with very, uh, and, and Bob will give uh, a, a lot of details on that. So uh, if you want to play to quantum optics, you have here the one of the best uh, situation uh, uh, to do that. So these two photons are highly correlated um, in uh, the classical and quantum uh, sense because they arise uh, from uh, the same parent photons. So Bob will uh, tell uh, this, uh, this story in detail. So here, when you stimulate, so you have exactly the same uh, energy level diagram, the same energy and uh, momentum uh, conservation relations, but you see here that you have a mixed state combining the two photons of the pair and residual uh, photon uh, stimulation uh, photon. So if you are interested in omega-2, you, you, you will say that you have performed uh, a difference frequency generation at omega-2, but now if you are uh, interested in uh, the signal, the beam at omega one, you see that you, we have one here and two photons here, and so you have optical parametric uh, amplification. So OPA and DFG are the two phases of, of the same process, which is a stimulated 
uh, splitting uh, of, of the photon. Uh, now, if you associate spontaneous splitting and stimulated splitting, you are going to uh, perform what we call optical parametric generation, or PG. So it starts a story, uh, starts exactly as for a spontaneous uh, splitting, spontaneous down conversion. So your incident beam is at omega-3. You generate pairs, and obviously you have uh, a good probability to have uh, a possibility to, to have a stimulation of the splitting of this photon, because you have, you have plenty photons at omega-3. So the possibility to have stimulation at omega-1, stimulation of the splitting of this photon, giving birth to these, uh, these pairs with this residual stimulation, and exactly the same for omega-2. So here, so clearly, uh, it's when you want to make uh, spontaneous down conversion process, a spontaneous split splitting, in fact, you have this cascading. So it's quasi impossible to study the pure spontaneous process. You have always the cascading between the spontaneous process and the uh, parametric uh, amplifications. And now if you put the nonlinear medium inside a cavity, you have built an optical parametric oscillators that can be resonated, uh, resonant at uh, omega-1 or omega-3, or also at, uh, at omega-1, uh, omega omega-2, and omega-3, if, uh, if you want. So we will have a lecture uh, on OPO given by uh, Majid uh, Ibrahim Zadeh. OK, so now let's move on four photon processes. So at the beginning, it's the same than for uh, three photons. Uh, so uh, photon fusions, so you have here three photons giving birth to uh, higher energy photons. The two uh, uh, fundamental equations for the energy and the momentum. So it, is, it corresponds to some frequency generation and the degenerate case corresponds to third harmonic uh, generation. And the reverse, the reverse is spontaneous splitting of one high energy photon into three lower energy photons, the corresponding diagram. So here you generate a, a triple, a triplet of photons. So uh, in my group, we work uh, a lot on that kind uh, of state. So the, the quantum properties of this uh, triplet is completely different than uh, the properties of uh, a pair of, uh, of uh, photons. So it can constitute, for example, a GHZ uh, state uh, of, uh, of light. And you have here, so the two same, uh, same than the, the, the fusion uh, scheme, uh, conservation of the energy and, um, and momentum. Um, you can stimulate this process using uh, one, one mode at omega-1, and exactly as for three photons, you can see that as a difference frequency generation or as uh, an optical parametric uh, amplification. You can also stimulate using two photons, two modes, so here at omega-1 and omega-3, and you, you have uh, this uh, mixed uh, state with the three photons of a triplet with the residual photons at omega-1 and uh, omega-3. So we, we, we studied a lot uh, this uh, scheme. I, I, I will uh, give you more details uh, this afternoon. OK. So you see that it is very close from the general point of view, very close to, that we, to what we have. Uh, uh, with three uh, photons. But now, there are something very specific to a four photon process, and something which I call, uh, it's a mixing of photon fusion and photon uh, splitting, which in fact is called four wave mixing. So four wave mixing corresponds to that. So you have two incident 
uh, beams at omega-1 and omega-4 interacting with the chi-3 medium, and you generate a pair of photons at omega-2 and omega-3. So you have here the corresponding energy uh, level uh, diagram. And you see here that the, uh, the, the, the conservation of energy is completely different than that we had in the case uh, in, in the previous cases, now we have omega-1 plus omega-4 omega plus omega-1 equal omega-2 plus omega-3, and k k4 plus k1 equal k2 plus k3. So it is also a k3 process. Four waves are involved, four photons are involved, but you see that from the quantum point of view, it's completely different. Uh, if you consider the uh, degeneracy, so Bob gave uh, some information on, uh, on that uh, this morning. So if you are interested in the real part of chi-3, it is a care effect, so leading to uh, the nonlinear index, N2. Uh, and now the, the, the other phase of this uh, process, degenerated process, is two-photon absorption when uh, governed by the imaginary part of chi-3. So care effect and two-photon absorption are four-wave mixing at the degeneracy corresponding uh, to uh, uh, yes, uh, degeneracy on uh, the four uh, <coughs> circular uh, frequencies. So obviously, these processes are always phase-matched. We will, we will discuss about this point uh, later on. Okay, so now let's move on modeling and symmetries. Uh, some words, I will give you more details uh, tomorrow, but the, 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 the main uh, things you have to, to, to know uh, for starting uh, to play. Uh, so modeling and symmetries of the linear and nonlinear electric uh, susceptibilities. So, I am going to discuss about the Lorentz uh, model, the, the, the main line of the, on the, of, of the Lorentz uh, model. Um, and as uh, Bob said this morning, it's a kind of miracle because it's a very simple model. And in fact, we are very surprised to see that when you use it for calculating, for example, the refractive index, it, it works. And so you can... We, we, we will have lectures uh, given by Valérie Vignard and Isabelle Le Durac on uh, the, uh, the current of uh, research in the modeling of the electric susceptibility. So obviously the goal is to be to have a, a precision of about 10 to the minus uh, 3 or 4, but 3. But using that kind of model, you can have a, a, an estimation of about 10 to the minus 2 uh, on the refractive uh, index and the order of magnitude for chi 2 and chi 3. We are going to see that. Okay, so, sorry. So in this, uh, the, the, the valency electrons are mainly concerned when you work uh, in this uh, visible and, far, and, and near infrared uh, range. And so the Lorentz model is very simply described by these three fundamental forces, the Coulomb force, uh, the friction uh, force, and the return force uh, depending on the potential. So here E opt is the electric field uh, of light. Uh, and so we are, we are focusing, we are going to focus now on the, the, the return force. And so in two uh, cases, uh, so the central symmetrical, in the case of a central symmetrical potential, and then in a non-central symmetrical potential. So you have a central symmetrical potential when you have two, imagine a, a, a dipolar uh, chemical uh, bond with two identical atoms A. And so we know that we can, uh, it's satisfying to describe uh, the potential as a function of x, so x is the, the distance, the displacement of the uh, uh, electron according to its equilibrium position, zero uh, here. And so in that case, we can describe the potential 
using even uh, exponent uh, of x, x2, x4, x6. Uh, uh, and so this part, it's what we call the uh, harmonic uh, part of the potential. And omega zero is the, the, the main frequency of the oscillator. I will come back to that point uh, later on. And uh, the terms in x4, x6, x6, x8, and so on, uh, correspond to the anharmonicity of the field. So here, imagine that the electric field of light oscillates like this. And so the elect you are going to transfer energy to the electrons. There is no absorption. Imagine, you, you can have absorption, but not necessary. You can transfer energy to matter even without absorption. You know that. So it means that here you can you, you, you move the electrons uh, along its potential. And if you use very intense light, you, you see that you can move the electrons at very high level uh, of energy. That means high level uh, position in the, in the potential. And so if you use a sufficiently high uh, intense uh, beam, you can, you can access to these parts described by these terms in x4, x6, and so on. So if you derive this potential, you have here the expression of the derived of force. And you see here that you have odd terms of x, x, x3, x5, x7, and so on. And we are going to see that this term is at the art of P1, this one at the uh, art of P3, and x5 given uh, P5. Okay, now if you consider a non-central symmetrical potential, so for example with two different uh, atoms, A and B, so in that case this curve is not uh, symmetrical, and so in that case you, uh, you need even and odd uh, terms in order to describe at best this, uh, this potential. And so one more time you have the harmonic uh, part, so the harmonic part corresponds to the, uh, the, the bottom of the potential. So the bottom of the potential is always described by this term. But when you, if the, the electrons have a sufficient energy, yes, you, you, you need these terms to that. So now you have an harmonicity created by x3, x4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on. And so here you will have odd and even uh, exponents to x for x, x, x2, x3. So x given rise to p1, x2 to p2, x3 to p3, and so on. So it means that in a non-central symmetrical, using a non-central symmetrical chemical bond or non-central symmetrical crystal, if, if you consider, uh, uh, if you have an, a, a macroscopic approach, you can have any kind of nonlinear process. But if you use, I come back to the uh, homopolar uh, chemical bonds, if you use uh, a central symmetrical medium, you can have on, only uh, odd uh, order nonlinear effects, P1, P3, P5, and so on. It's the case, for example, for cubic crystals, gas, liquid, and so on. And here, non-central symmetrical crystals, you can have all, all the spectrum of the nonlinear effect can be uh, obtained and uh, observed. Okay, so I'm not going to, 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 to go too much in detail. If, you, if we want to have the, the, the electron motion, so we have to write the fundamental principle of dynamics. So considering the three uh, forces, uh, I imagine that the most part of you knows uh, this uh, story. Uh, so on right here, you have the, the optical uh, part and here the uh, electronic uh, part. And if you integrate these equations, you can access to x as a function of t, uh, 
that is to say, the instantaneous position of the electron uh, under the uh, electric field of, uh, of light. And so when we have that, uh, we, can, uh, we can, the most part of the job is done because we can calculate the electronic polarization. The electronic polarization is simply given by the product of x, the inst instantaneous position. So at the equilibrium, x equals, equals zero, the electronic polarization is equal to zero. But if you move the electron uh, far, or if you move the electron uh, far from its, its uh, equilibrium position, you, have, you create an electronic uh, polarization. And that you have to multiply by the, the electronic charge and the number, the concentration of charges, and you have the electronic polarization. Okay, and so if it's, it's not too uh, intense, and we can use a perturbative uh, approach, uh, Paul Corcum uh, will give you uh, the physics corresponding to the, to the high energy uh, case, where this approach uh, cannot be uh, applied. But in this case, uh, we, if we consider the solution written like this, uh, take, taking uh, x1 as a solution of the equation without the anharmonic uh, term, and taking, for example here, we, we take three Fourier components. We consider an optical field with three Fourier components omega-1, omega-2, and omega-3, with omega-1 plus omega-2 equal uh, omega-3. And so, doing this, we can access to P1, P, to, to, to P, given by, um, given by the sum of uh, um, uh, the, the, the different order of the electronic polarization. Okay, and so, doing this, we can establish the easily the analytical expression of the first order pol electronic polarization. So you see here that obviously, if you have three incident beams at omega one, omega two, and omega three, you will have three Fourier components of the the first order electronic polarization at omega one, omega two, and omega three. And doing this, we can also calculate the uh, first order uh, the, the the, the first order electric uh, susceptibility for each Fourier uh, component. And you see that here you have uh, D at the denominator, and D, you see that it is a complex uh, quantity. So chi1, in the most general case, is a, a complex uh, quantity. OK, same job for uh, P2. And so here, which is interesting, so there are more people uh, in the train. And so you recognize here a terms at 2 omega 2, corresponding to second harmonic generation. Omega 1 plus omega 2, omega 1 minus omega 2, it's second uh, some frequency generation and different frequency generation. And you see here terms omega 1 minus omega 1, omega 2 minus omega 2. So these two cases correspond to difference frequency generation in the, at the degeneracy. And it's what we call optical rectification. It means that two optical fields can create a static electric field in the matter. It's optical uh, rectification. So all these things appear uh, when you make this very simple Lorentz model, this classical uh, this classical uh, model. Okay, and so uh, we can, by using this, uh, calculate, uh, establish the expression of chi2 at omega 1 plus or minus omega 2, and obviously it is also uh, a, a complex quantity, so typically uh, the magnitude is typically of the order of 10 to the minus 12 volt Per, uh, per meter, picometer per volt. Okay, so for the third order polarization, same things. So you have uh, uh, the, the Fourier component corresponding to third harmonic generation, some frequency generation, the care effects and the four-wave mixing 
as we saw uh, previously, and also uh, the difference frequency, uh, uh, so difference frequency generation at the same or different uh, uh, fr frequencies. And here I just give the expression of chi three uh, corresponding to uh, the care effect. Um, okay. Uh, so you see here, so you have to, to, to put together the corpuscular uh, picture I gave you previously and this classical undulatory uh, picture uh, given here if you want to, to understand uh, very well uh, the things. Okay, so now let's focus on the linear electric uh, susceptibility. So if the, uh, this quantity, omega zero, uh, two minus omega two, uh, greater, bigger than uh, the imaginary part of uh, the D uh, function, um, then uh, uh, you, then, uh, so chi one is uh, a real uh, quantity in that case. So uh, how can we uh, have that? Omega zero, I told you, is, uh, you remember, it appears in uh, the uh, potential and it is the, the, the main frequency of the oscillator. Uh, and you have to know uh, that, describing the, the, the harmonicity of the potential, and you have to know that in matter, you have several main frequencies. And between, so when you, you have an incident light at omega zero, for example, so uh, you have a strong absorption, but if you are far from omega zero, you, you can consider that the medium is transparent, even if you can have residual absorption. So you are always between two oscillators. Um, so imagine that you are your light your incident light at omega is between omega zero A and omega zero B. Uh, I don't know, uh, omega zero A, for example, in the infrared and omega zero B in the UV. You know, uh, the glass, uh, for, for the glass, uh, the wavelength, the, 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 the UV wavelength is around 0.3 uh, microns and the infrared uh, wavelengths corresponding uh, to omega zero A is around 2.7 microns. Okay, so when you, you put light at around 1.5 microns, uh, you are between these two uh, uh, wavelengths, these two main oscillators. And in that case, it, it's very, in physics, we make very simple calculations and we know, we know how to make a sum. Uh, and so here we describe the, the first order electric susceptibility by the sum between the two contributions of the two uh, main uh, of the two oscillators. And so you have the concentration of these two oscillators and you have here, obviously, so these two main frequencies appearing at the denominator. Okay, so now, in optics, we prefer to work often, we work uh, with wavelength, and uh, we can also at this, uh, from the previous expression, we can, uh, we can obtain the refractive index, which is given by the square root of one plus uh, chi one at omega. And so if you do that, because we have the, the nice expression of chi one, uh, from our perturbative approach. And we have here this equation uh, given uh, the uh, refractive, so here it is not n, but n square, there is a mistake. Uh, n square of lambda is equal to one plus k lambda two and so on and so on. It is the Selmayer equations uh, with k a and k b uh, corresponding to the properties, uh, spectroscopic uh, properties of, uh, of matter. And you know, you put the typical, you put the charge of the electrons, the typical charge of uh, concentration of, of charge, 
and you put it in that. Uh, you take lambda equal 0.5 or 0.6 microns, and you are going to find n equal 1.6. It is the order of magnitude. It is at uh, 10 to the minus 1, the value of the refractive index of typical uh, oxide, typical uh, uh, so so solid uh, medium. So it's incredible, and it's a very simple uh, model, and it works. It is clear that the quantum models will start from that. We, you, we are going to see uh, later on, probably not, not, so in two or three uh, slides, you will see that the uh, analytical expression of chi 2, chi 3, and so on are very close to the expression uh, um, uh, shown by uh, Bob, uh, the, the quantum expression shown by Bob uh, this morning. So if you plot n as a function of lambda, you have this, uh, lambda b, lambda 0 b, lambda 0 a, the wavelength corresponding to the two uh, oscillators. And so this case is because n decreases as a function of lambda, it is called the normal dispersion. If you are here, you have something like this. It is not uh, plotted here, but you have obviously continuity here. And in this part, for example, we have abnormal dispersion. But usually, in nonlinear optics, we consider a transparency range. We hope that it is transpar transparent. And we are in the uh, dispers normal dispersion uh, range of uh, the matter. Okay, so now chi 2, uh, from uh, the uh, expressions uh, I gave you uh, previously, we can see that chi 2, in fact, uh, can be expressed as a product of uh, three chi 1 at omega, omega 1, omega 2. And it gives uh, chi 2 at omega equal omega 1 plus or minus omega 2. And this factor here, delta, small delta, is given here by, uh, some, by the spectroscopic properties of uh, the atom of the, of the matter. Uh, and which is very important here is that this parameter is a non-dispersive parameter. And you will see, uh, probably in the talk of, uh, given by uh, Isabelle Le Dourac, that it is uh, uh, extensively used by people who conceive nonlinear crystals. When you are uh, a, a chemist and when you, 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 you try to find the, the, the good, the good, good nonlinear materials, you don't know at which wavelength you, you want to work. Dealing with nonlinear properties, dealing with transparency is it's different. And so this parameter is very, very interesting because you can discuss independently of wavelength uh, purpose. Okay, so obviously, so it is what we call the Miller rule. This rule is a, the 1D, the unidirectional, directional Miller rule. And if you plot uh, chi 2 as a function of lambda, obviously you will have this dispersion uh, with, uh, yes, because it, is, it depends on chi 1, so you will have also normal dispersion for chi 2 if you have normal dispersion for chi 1. The same for chi 3, given by the product of 4 uh, chi 1, and you will have also uh, normal dispersion for, uh, for chi 3. Okay, so I have finished. So it's very, very basic, so, but, but you have to, to, to know that kind of things because it's... You have the physics and you have the, the starting equation. So you, you have to, to, to master that kind of, uh, of easy things. Okay, so now if we move from 1D to 3D, uh, a kind of real life, even if 1D is very, uh, you know, that now we, we are able to, to fabricate nanowires and so on. And so uh, it means that we can make non-linear optics in a 1D uh, space, but the main part of uh, my talk will be devoted to a 3D, uh, 3D space. Okay, and so um, just because, just few words, because tomorrow I will uh, give you a lot of details 
and the philosophy of spatial symmetry and the impact of spatial symmetry on um, uh, the modeling on, on, on the nonlinear properties, you have to know uh, that chi 2, chi 3, chi 4, and so on are tensors, polar tensors. I will define you what is a polar tensor tomorrow. So chi 2 is a rank 3 uh, tensor. So it is uh, described by a 3 pair 9 matrix, that is to say 27 coefficients in the general case. Chi 3 is a rank 4 uh, tensor. It means 80, 81 coefficients. Uh, so a lot of, a lot of coefficients. So heavy uh, calculations. So we'll see, uh, we'll see tomorrow that the coefficients of chi 2 are non-zero only in the case of uh, non-central symmetrical uh, crystals. So I give you, but I will come back to that tomorrow, so I am not going to spend time on this. So you have chi 2 coefficients only in the case of non-central symmetrical media. So no chi 2 in gas or liquid. You can have a chi 2 at the surface of the li liquid because you have a breaking of the symmetry. Okay, but in the volume of a liquid, no possibility to have a chi 2. For chi 3, no restriction uh, about, uh, no restriction uh, is brought by the inversion operator. Um, and so the 32 crystal classes uh, can have non zero chi 3, have non zero uh, chi 3 uh, coefficients. So you have here this. So it becomes heavy, but it is real life. And you have also here, you see, so, so you have the, the, the low level of symmetry. So you have 81 elements. And here the cubic uh, uh, crystals, so the, with the highest degree of symmetry. But you, you see that even in that uh, very high degree symmetry, you have a lot of non-zero coefficients. But it's life. And we can have fun with that kind of things. It's very good. When you start the day with some tensors like this, maybe you are on a good way. It's a kind of therapy, you, you, you see. You can also walk in the mountains. It's, it's, it works also. OK. But maybe it's more dangerous to walk in the mountain. OK. We have the 3D Miller uh, rule here. It's very interesting because here, so it, it can be demonstrated, uh, you can uh, establish, we can establish that each element of chi 2, chi 2 y, j, k at omega equal omega 1 plus or minus omega 2 is given here by this, the product of the three main uh, coefficients of the chi 1 uh, tensor, that is to say chi 1, uh, y, chi 1, y, y, j, j, and k, k. And here, don't uh, forget that now the Miller coefficient is a tensor. So a rank 3 tensor for chi 2, and the same for uh, chi 3. You have the same kind of uh, expression. OK, so now let's move. So we, we discussed, and, and I will come back on that tomorrow, on spatial symmetries, a few words on uh, intrinsic symmetries. So intrinsic uh, symmetries means symmetries that are not linked to the, uh, um, uh, to the matter, to the spatial uh, symmetries. The first one is the AB, ABDP. So uh, so published in the, the marvelous paper of uh, 1962 of Armstrong, Bloombergen, Duquoin, and Pershan. And uh, when there is no absorption at the considered Fourier components, then chi 2 and, uh, so chi 1, 2, but chi 2 and chi 3 are real quantities. And by this way, so you, you can focus on this sentence here, chi 2, can 3, and so on, are invariant by concomitant permutation of the Cartesian index and of the corresponding circular frequencies. And it is written here in these <coughs> equations. 
you have, so first point, you have to take care of the sequence of writing, the coherence between the sequence of writing of the Cartesian indices, Y, J, K, and the way you write here the polarization. So I recommend you always to write chi2 of omega 3, for example, equal omega 1 plus omega 2. It means that it is chi 2 at the circular frequency of omega 3, arising from an interaction between omega 1, uh, the sum frequency of omega 1 and omega 2. And take care that for the tensor calculation, there is a correspondence. So the first Cartesian index corresponds to omega 3, the second one to the second pulse, uh, circular frequency here, omega 1, and k to omega 2. So here, ABDP stipulates that if you want to permutate the Cartesian index, you have to permutate the circular frequencies. If you want to, per to permutate the circular frequencies, you have to permutate the Cartesian uh, indices. And so you have, for example, sorry, you have, for example, these equalities. And it is very, very important. Uh, we are going to see that it leads to a, a strong simplification in uh, the establishment of the propagation equation in the nonlinear uh, regime. And the same uh, for uh, chi 3, you have that kind of. So you see that it gives linked links between different elements of chi 2 at different circular frequencies. Good. Second type of uh, intrinsic symmetry, the Kleinman uh, symmetry. W when there is no absorption, like in the ABDP case, but also when there is no dispersion at uh, the considered Fourier uh, components. And so, so, for example, if you, if you are somewhere here between the two oscillators, okay, so you can consider that the dispersion is negligible. And so, by this way, by this way, you see here that you can permutate the Cartesian index without any permutation of the circular frequencies. It means that chi2 is fully symmetrical. And we symbolize that, you know, when you see that in a tensor, tensor algebra, uh, you put some bridge between y and j and a bridge between j and, uh, and k. It means that this rank 3 tensor is fully symmetrical. And the same for uh, chi 3 here. Okay? So now, if you apply Kleinman symmetry to, uh, to chi 2, you, it leads to uh, uh, a new reduction of the number of independent coefficients. We saw, but I am not given detail, I give you the details tomorrow. The spatial symmetry uh, allows us to reduce the number of independent coefficients, but this intrinsic symmetry also allow us to, uh, to perform a new reduction of the number of independent coefficients. And because we have plenty of coefficients, we are very happy when we can kill uh, different uh, uh, coefficients. Okay, and so you can, so you will see often this uh, reference. So I, I do, uh, uh, like my friend uh, Bob, so, uh, uh, so here it's a, a chapter uh, I wrote with Joseph Zis, published uh, in 2005 and 2000, with the new editions in 2007 in the International Tables for Crystallography. So for all the stories of tensors, calculations, and so on, you will have a lot of details in this uh, reference. Okay. You know, even uh, under Kleinman uh, symmetry, uh, assumption, we have a lot of people in the train. It's real life. Okay, so when, uh, when we have this uh, symmetry, 
Kleinman symmetry, we can uh, use the contracted notation. That is to say that instead of uh, writing a, j, k, we write k, uh, chi, mu, m with this convention of uh, notation. So take care, but I recommend you when you begin something, begin calculations in nonlinear optics, don't take the contracted notations. If you do that, I think that you have nine ch chances over 10 to make a dangerous mistake. So you take the full tensor with uh, no contracted notation. Okay, the same for chi 3 We can also uh, use this notation. And uh, third kind of intrinsic uh, symmetries, <coughs> symmetry due to equalities between frequencies. For example, if you consider chi 2 at 2 omega, it means chi 2 governing second harmonic generation. In that case, because here the two frequencies of the two photons are equal. So it is exactly the case when we made the assumption that there is no dispersion. But in that case, obviously, there is no dispersion because it is the same circular frequency. So in that case, you have symmetry over uh, the two last indices. And so in that case, you can write uh, this. So we have symmetry. Uh, on the two last Cartesian indices. The same for third harmonic generation here. So we have two bridges here. Or in that case, for example, if you have omega 2 equal omega plus omega 1 plus omega, so you have symmetry concerning J and L and so on. Uh, and so you see here that in the case of uh, the care um, of... Uh, so here, no, it's not the... It is a care effect, and so you have a, a, a full a symmetrical uh, tensor. Okay, and just a word about the D convention. So take care. So often, long time ago, people say, okay, we define D2 equal to 1 over 2 uh, chi 2 uh, for uh, simple reasons. Um, in the, 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 the Taylor uh, series, so it allows to, 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 to kill the, the prefactor in the Taylor series, but uh, take care because often or sometimes there are some confusions and so you can have some problems. Uh, so take care when you, 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 you read a paper uh, uh, to, to know if it's D or if it's uh, chi. And for chi 3, for example, the convention is not always the same. So here I give 1 over 4. So please use chi and not d. But you are free to do what you want. <laughs> but now I am an old man, so I, I, I can uh, give you this uh, advertisement. Well, only if they want the right answer should they use it. <laughs> you know, of course, they can do whatever they want. <laughs> Yes. But don't be wrong. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Just check the time. Half an hour. So now let's move on basic linear crystal optics. If you want to make linear nonlinear optics, and often it's a story involving crystals, you have absolutely to master linear crystal optics. Crystal optics. And so, very rapidly, very quickly, uh, for that purpose, it's very convenient to consider the indicatrix of the refractive index. And this uh, surface is called the index surface. So it's not the ellipsoid uh, surface, it is the index surface. And it's a wonderful tool in crystal, uh, in crystal optics. And uh, so here, so the index surface gives the value, the amplitude of the refractive index as a function of the direction of the k vector. So k is given by omega over c n u. Here u is the 
a unit vector of uh, the, the, the wave vector. We define, so u is here, expressed in a frame which here is the, and Patricia Segond will uh, discuss uh, a lot on this point, x, y, and z is the dielectric frame, that is to say, the frame in which the matrix of chi 1 is diagonal. The dielectric frame is defined like this. So it is diagonal, and the chi 1 x, x, y, y, and z, z are the principal values uh, of this matrix, so the, the values of the, of the diagonal. All the other coefficients in this frame are zero. Okay, so we can define the refractive, the principle which we call the ref principal refractive indices, and x equal so the square root of one plus chi one x x, the same for n y and uh, n z, and so starting from the Maxwell e Maxwell equations, taking a rotational of rotational of e that is to say, starting the work to establish the propagation equation, we establish, uh, we, 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 we can get an equation which is called the Fresnel equation. And the two solutions, this Fresnel equation is a quadratic equation that have two solutions. These two solutions uh, are written n plus and n minus. So given here, so in this uh, simple, uh, a simple uh, expression here. So n plus and n minus are expressed as a function you see here of the uh, Cartesian coordinates of the unit vector of the wave vector and you have also the principal uh, values of the refractive uh, indices. And the quantity n plus minus n minus is the birefringency. So the birefringency is precisely this quantity. Okay, let's see what, how is the index surface in different media. Let's begin with isot the isotropic class. So the isotropic class is it's a case of cubic crystals, gas, liquids, but also glasses. Um, and so in that case, uh, nx equal ny equal nz, and we call this index n. And so in that case, because we have these two equalities, then two consequences for the index surface. At first, only one layer, n plus equal n minus for each direction, for at any direction uh, for the wave uh, vector. So only n plus equal, equal n minus, and the second consequence is that this surface is a sphere. It means that the refractive index is equal to n at any value of u. So here I represented it in one octane of, uh, of the space. It's a sphere. So you consider any direction, you have only one refractive, one value for the refractive index. Now we have a second type of optical class. We are, we, we are speaking of optical uh, class, the so uniaxial class. In that case, it's the case for media, so a lot of crystals belong to this uh, uniaxial class. You have nx equal ny, uh, um, written NO, O for ordinary, different than NZ, and we uh, call this index NEE -E for extraordinary. And in that case, we have two different, in the general case, two different values in a given direction of propagation. So N plus different than N minus. So you have here a nice picture uh, drawn by uh, one of uh, my PhD students. And you see here uh, in one fourth of the space, so you, you, you are under uh, the uh, index surface, and you see here an ellipse. So the internal layer is an ellipse, an ellipsoid, and the external one 
is a sphere. So now, if you make, uh, uh, if you, you, you cut this index surface, so here I, we took xz, xz here, you see that you have a circle and an ellipsoid. And so here, and we, we can have exactly the same situation. So here, I took the example of a negative uniaxial crystal. A negative, the sign of the uniaxial crystal is defined by the quantity Ne minus NO. So if Ne is smaller than NO, we say that you have, we have a negative uniaxial crystal. Now, if we take a positive uniaxial crystal, you will have an ellipsoid uh, at the external and a sphere at the in inside uh, the, uh, the ellipsoid. And it's very easy because we describe the things with sphere and ellipse. It's very easy so to get, for example, here n plus, so n plus equal n zero uh, for each value, any value of theta, and n minus will be given here. It's a current point of this uh, ellipse and given by these very simple equations as a function of the principal ordinary and extraordinary reflective uh, index. Okay, more uh, complicated, the biaxial class. Okay, uh, class. So it is uh, the case where the three principal refractive indices are different. In that case, as in the uniaxial case, the index surface has two uh, layers, uh, but it's a little bit more complicated. So one more time, so you have here this night, uh, nice uh, picture. And you see here, so it's very interesting. So no sphere, no ellipsoids. So in that case, uh, so the, the surface is very complex, very nice. And you see here that you have the internal uh, layer here in contact here with this external layer. If now you make a cut of this surface in the XZ plane, so it is written here, okay, so you, you, you can recognize here an ellipse. Here, yes, here, I don't know where is the ellipse. I, I, be, I am probably tired, but ellipse and a circle somewhere circle, yes, the circle here, the ellipse uh, here, but you have to see that not like an ellipse intersecting a circle, but you have to see that because it is a physics, like has two surfaces, an external surfaces in blue here with a part, a circular part, elliptic part, circular elliptic, and an internal layer here in red dashed, uh, which correspond to here. So this one correspond to mode minus the, the red, and the blue one to, to, mode, uh, to mode plus. There are also different convention of definition of the sign of uh, the biaxial uh, crystals, but it's not really interesting. Okay. So now, always using uh, Maxwell equations, uh, we can uh, calculate the direction and the amplitude of all the fields that are involved in uh, these uh, linear uh, optics. Um, and uh, a fortiori in uh, nonlinear uh, optics. What you have to know, so, it can be calculated, uh, fully calculated, without uh, any approximation. What you have, what is written here, you see here, so we, it starts with here, this direction here. You know here, we are in a given direction. In the general case, we know that we have two possible values of the refractive index, n minus and n plus. So here you have k minus, and k plus, and these two vectors are uh, collinear because we are in the same, we consider the same directions for the two modes minus and plus. And now what we see here, we see that uh, we have 
two, two planes, which we uh, uh, return pi plus and pi minus, two orthogonal planes. These two planes are called the neutral vibration uh, planes. And in fact, it means that here, for example, the wave connected with N plus will have is its electric field E plus in pi plus, D plus, S plus here is a Umov pointing uh, vector. So E, D, S, and K, uh, so the four, these four vectors, so electric field, electric displacement, pointing vector, and the, the wave vector are contained, are coplanar, are in the same plane, pi plus for mod plus, and pi minus for the mode minus. So it means that in a uniaxial crystal medium, uh, in, a uni, in a biaxial uh, medium, uh, in a given direction of propagation, two possible uh, values of the refractive index, and also two possible conf configuration of the fields pi plus, pi minus. So it's a, a very strong restriction, in fact. <clears throat> uh, so I'm not going to give details, but it's, it's easy to calculate to have the analytical expression of the electric field, the ordinary. So just one, one thing. Yes, the ordinary. Uh, ah, yes, maybe here. You know here, you have two marvelous and specific directions here. Uh, the, 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 the direction joining two opposite ombilics. So this point is called the ombilic in, uh, in topology. And this you see here that we have two directions joining the, uh, two, uh, the two ombilics, two, two pair two. And you understand, so, and these directions are called the optical axis. And it's why, so you see here, then it's such a media, it's such a medium, a biaxial uh, uh, crystal. You have two optical axes, and it's why we call it biaxial. And for, you see that in that case, you have only one optical axis, because you have only two ombilics. It's why we call that uniaxial. Just the uh, origin of terminology. Okay. So we, have, we can calculate the unit electric field uh, Cartesian coordinates as a function of the, of the direction of propagation. No problem, it works. And in the general case, um, the electric field of mode plus is not perpendicular to that of mode minus. Okay, in the, in the isotropic uh, crystals or gas, media, glass, no problem. You can uh, show that you can access to any direction of polarization. So, in an anisotropic med in an anisotropic medium, only for a given direction of propagation, of only two directions of uh, polarization are loaded, contained in the neutral pla uh, vibration planes. In the case of isotropic medium. No problem, no restriction in, a, in any direction of propagation. You can access, you can propagate light with any direction of, uh, of polarization. So you are completely free in isotropic, uh, in isotropic medium. But we are going to see that we will have, a, 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 we will pay the price of this freedom. Okay, pointing vectors. Um, so, pointing vector is given by the vectorial product of E by H, and the modulus of the pointing vector gives the intensity. And uh, we can show that S plus is perpendicular to A plus, and S minus to E minus. But A plus and E plus and E minus are not perpendicular to k plus and k minus. 
Uh, and now, if we, for example, if we make quantum optics and if we want to, exp we can express the, the, the pointing vectors, the modulus of the pointing vectors as a function of the current <coughs> photons written n here, uh, which gives the number of photons per second and, and per square meter. And so you have this. So S is equal to H bar omega n. So it is in watt per square uh, meter. OK. So you have to be convinced that there is a strong influence of the linear crystal optics optical properties on nonlinear optical properties. So it is absolutely necessary to master this step of, uh, of, uh, of the story. So uh, the index surface, we will see uh, that it will be at the art of nonlinear optics for the phase matching consideration. Uh, the interactions between mode plus and minus uh, as a di different uh, uh, Fourier components, so when you say, okay, we make some frequency generation at omega 1 and omega 2, omega 1 can be in mode plus or minus, omega 2 in, in, in mode plus and minus. Uh, and we will see also that, it's a negative point, that we can have attenuation of the efficiency, of parametric efficiency, due to the anisotropy and due, due to walk-off angle, but also... Uh, uh, temporal walk-off, but temporal walk-off is not due to the spatial symmetries, but to uh, dispersion. Okay, yes, 10 minutes. So coupled equations and manley row relations. Um, so now you are a kind of boss in crystal optics, crystal linear optics, so we can begin to uh, uh, propagate uh, the fields in this medium. Uh, and so, for that, you saw, these two equations are two of the four equations I have uh, shown you at the beginning of my lecture. So the Maxwell equations um, written for each Fourier component. So rotational of E, rotational of H, and so in order to obtain the propagation equation, it's necessary to take, so we can, so what, what we want to have? We want to have the uh, uh, X, the, the spatial and temporal motion evolution of the electric field and so uh, for that, it's why Maxwell equations are, are very uh, powerful. It's easy. If you take the rotational of rotational uh, of E, uh, you can access to this equation that can be uh, analyt analytically or not uh, integrated. But by integrated this equation, which is the propagation equation in the nonlinear regime, uh, we can access to the electric field of the light as a function of the position is in the medium and as a function also of time. So here I, I, I consider all, all the equations that are going to be written are at a, a, an instantaneous uh, time here. And so, uh, so we have this propagation equation for each Fourier components. You see here that if the nonlinear polarization uh, is equal to, so the pi 2, pi 3, and so on, is equal to 0, so you have 0 <coughs> here, and you uh, obtained the propagation equation in the linear uh, regime. OK. What is marvelous, but not so surprising, is that the plane wave is a solution of this equation. So we are going to use the plane wave uh, solution. And so if here, so now we are per going to perform the calculation in another uh, frame, big X, Y, and Z, 
Uh, it's a fixed frame. It's also a laboratory uh, frame. It means that it doesn't move with the wave. The only link with the wave is that k is along, uh, z is taken along k. And so here, you have the electric field, E, not perpendicular to k in the general case. Rho here is called the spatial walk-off uh, angle. And so here, I have written the uh, electric field uh, expression in depending on omega, x, y, and z. So you have here the face of the things. And so if you detail here what we have uh, in, um, in this, so E, uh, in this, sorry, you have the product of the real amplitude by exponential j uh, phi, which is the initial uh, phase. So E is a complex amplitude and A is a real uh, amplitude. If we consider the slowly varying uh, envelope approximation, uh, that means that, in fact, the increasing or decreasing of the amplitude of the fields at the, each circular frequencies, this rate of decreasing is uh, slower than the, the rate of the uh, uh, natural uh, cycle. So, which is the case usually uh, uh, when we are in the case of perturbative nonlinear uh, optics. In that, so it will be not the case uh, in for uh, uh, attosecond uh, optics. Uh, in that case, we can simplify the calculation and we uh, access to this simple equation the derivative of each of the complex amplitude of each Fourier component, uh, so dE over dz. And you see here that, so you have the phase here, and you have here the scalar product of the electric field at the polarization. So it's very important to, 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 to see that and to understand that what we are going to have from that point, the propagation in the nonlinear regime, in fact, is an interference interaction between two fields at the same frequency. It's an interference between the nonlinear polarization at omega y and the radiated field at omega 1, E here, the, the unit electric field vector. So the nonlinear process, when we are interested in modeling the propagation, is an interference, like in linear optics, interference between two waves at the same frequency. The polarization wave, the electronic polarization wave, and the uh, light emitted by this polarization. But we know that this electronic polarization, in fact, is obtained from, for example, two incident beams at different polarization. But the result is an electronic polarization, for example, at omega. Remember the algorithm I gave you. When you have created this, the polarization, at omega, coming, raising from, for example, the sum frequency omega 1 plus omega 2, this wave at omega is going to radiate a field at omega. Yes. It is nonlinear optics. And it is described by this simple interference. And so, okay, and so here, from that, so don't be afraid, it's, it's close to the end. Two minutes. Um, so uh, you see here the three so it's very important equations. The derivative of each complex amplitude at omega 1, omega 2, and omega 3 as a function here of z. z is along the direction of propagation. 
And you can, can see here that you have the phase part, E minus JK1, Z, uh, K1, K2, and K3. The three scalar products, E1, E1 scalar P1, and so on, and these equations are fully coupled thanks to, in fact, and we are going to see that, thanks to the expression of pi, uh, P1, 2, and 3, the second order uh, polarization. And so here, if you consider, so I have written here the, the, the expression, the analytical expression of the uh, uh, three Fourier components of the electronic polarization. And here, what you have, so it's exactly what I, we, we, we had written at the beginning of my lectures. And if we concentrate here on this tensorial part here, chi2 contracted, so I will explain to you tomorrow how does it work, this contracted product, product contracted with this here, with these two uh, tensor, uh, uh, this tensor uh, product. So you have here <laughs> this part, and it's exactly at this point uh, where ABDP can uh, simplify our life. And so you, you see here, but we have not uh, enough time, but you will have time to do that at home, probably. Uh, here, I'm sure that you, you, you will do that. Uh, you see, by writing here completely, and I will explain to you how does it work tomorrow, when you uh, write this uh, uh, contracted product, so it is written like this, if it's necessary to, to write the full expression with all the Cartesian indices, according to ABDP symmetry, you have equality between, in fact, these three terms. And so it's very, it's, it's very nice because, and so we, we, we call this effective coefficient. So the effective coefficient is given here by the scalar product between this and this. And so, and it is my last slide of this morning. And so here uh, you have uh, the uh, coupled, uh, the complex amplitude equations. And you see here that these equations are coupled because you see that in the expression of the derivative of E1, we have E3 and E2 in, at the level of E2, E3, and E1, and so on. And so it is the starting point of uh, the... Uh, so now we have really the propagation equations uh, directly uh, useful for uh, uh, playing to nonlinear uh, optics. The follow yes, okay. So, so now let's move. Um, let's. Uh, so ah yes, because yes, okay. Sorry. So now let's move. It's very easy from the complex uh, systems to obtain the real amplitude uh, equations. And so here, if we do that, it's because we uh, can uh, express uh, the things uh, as a function here of the phase. Maybe, maybe, yes. Uh, I, uh, I come back to this uh, first two very important parameters here, the effective coefficients. And we know that in this effective coefficient, we have chi2, the matter, and we have also the configuration of polarization. The other very important parameter is delta k. So Bob uh, speaks a lot on that uh, this morning. And delta k here is given by k3 minus k1 minus k2. Delta K is not the phase mismatch between the three interacting waves. Delta K is a mismatch between two waves. 
the electronic polarization and the radiated field. Okay? So delta K is a mismatch between two waves at the same frequency. It's just a, a small remark. Okay, and so here, why it is very interesting to write, to consider the real amplitudes? It is because we see here delta phi, and delta phi, naturally, so it comes when you, 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 you start from the, 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 the complex uh, equations. Delta phi is equal to phi, phi 3 minus phi 1 minus phi 2. So it is a phase mismatch between the initial phases of the quadratic polarization of the radiated uh, field. We will come back to that later on, and it's very important to consider uh, that point. Okay, so same story for uh, four wave uh, for four wave parametric interaction. So here, the first kind, you know, you remember that we have two kinds of chi three uh, interactions. One give three or three give one, and two give two. So here it is uh, the, the equations for one give three or three give give one. And so, and so here, uh, so you have the same kind, same structure of uh, equations. The solutions will be completely different, but the, 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 these uh, differential, uh, the, the structure of, these, of the differential equations is exactly the same than for a three-wave uh, process. And you have also here the effective coefficients depending on chi-3 and de delta k, which is, so, the uh, phase mismatch between the third order electronic polarization and the radiated uh, field. Um, okay, and so the phase mismatch here is given by this, and the effective coefficient is given by this. So here I will come back to uh, these tensor uh, calculations uh, tomorrow. Uh, so using ABDP symmetry, we can establish that these four quantities are equal, so it's good. So we will have here uh, this uh, equality, here. so this effective, the third order effective coefficient here, and the delta K, uh, the delta K here. Okay, and, um, sorry, excuse me. Excuse me, because here it is, yes, sorry. Uh, so now we move uh, on the second kind of uh, four photon processes, pr process, uh, two give two, uh, omega four plus omega one equal omega two plus omega three. So you have the same kind of equations. So the, you have not exactly the same uh, configuration of, of signs. So it is located at the, the in the phase and also the complex conjugate are not exactly at the same places. You have also a phase mismatch here and the effective coefficient and, uh, okay, so it is for the, uh, so, so no, no real big difference at this step between a three-wave process and a four-wave uh, process. And so uh, for uh, summarizing the things, we have two case parameters, uh, delta K, and delta K depends on the refractive indices. So you understand that for uh, performing nonlinear optics, it's absolutely necessary to master chi one. <coughs> Sorry. And um, the effective coefficient, uh, chi two F or chi three F, which depends on chi one, one more time, linear optical properties uh, depends on the electric fields and you know that the electric fields depends on chi1 and the nonlinear susceptibilities chi2 and chi3. So the effective coefficient is something very rich involving both first order, second and third order uh, uh, properties. And so we will be discussed on that uh, later on. Um, good. 
Um, so we established uh, the uh, differential equations for the complex electric field, for the real electric field. Now we can establish the same kind of equations. So from these equations, we can calculate the coupled equations relative to the intensity at each Fourier components. And so using this, so the intensity in watt per square meter, so this intensity, the intensity depends on the square of the modulus of the electric field. And so using this, so it, these calculations are uh, easy. So the differential of I according to Z, so is given by this expression. So you have the sum of these two terms, E D uh, conjugate uh, of E over DZ plus E conjugate multiplied by DE over DZ. And if you use this, you uh, obtain this. So you have, uh, for, for, so for the free wave interactions, you have here the, uh, the differential equations. Uh, so these equations are fully coupled because you, need, you know at the level of psi here, you see that you have the three interacting uh, electric fields at omega one, omega two, and uh, omega three. So you have this uh, these three equations, so these three equations arise from the three uh, couple equations written with the electric, uh, with the, uh, electric fields. And so, you, but here it's very, very simple. And you, you, you see immediately here that we have this relation between <coughs> the differential of the intensity. And these relations are called manley rho uh, relations. Uh, and so we, you have this, this relation, and you see uh, here that the differential of the sum of the total intensity, so you know, okay, you have, for example, a sum frequency generation, so at a given position in the medium, at Z position, you have I1, I2, I3, and now if you make the derivative of I1 plus I2 plus I3, you obtain this, which is zero because we have conservation of the energy. Okay, so it's not surprising. So just here, we know that our calculation is right because if we had something different than zero, probably we 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 we, we had a problem or it's a revolution in, in, in physics. Okay, and so for the four-wave uh, four mixing, so, so a four-wave process, one give three or three give one, we have these equations and so on. One more time, we have this, the conservation of, uh, of the total intensity. The same for uh, the, the scheme two give two, same things uh, here, and uh, Okay, we can play uh, the same game uh, with the current photons coupled equations, always starting. So now we start from the expression of the intensities, for example. And so simply the, uh, the photon current is given by the intensity divided by the quantum of each uh, of the photons. And so we get these, uh, these uh, three equations for a three wave uh, process. And what we see, so we have this, so these equations can also be uh, called Manley-Rho equations because it's also, it's energetical uh, uh, considerations. And uh, so you have uh, this, so you see that's uh, the derivative at omega one and omega two has the opposite sign than that at omega three here. So it means that for example, if you have some frequency generation, uh, you will have, as a function of the propagation, a decreasing of the number of photons at omega-1 at omega-2, obviously, because some of them collapse to give a photon at omega-3. And so you, you will have, 
for example, a decreasing a negative negativity at this level. And obviously, if you create photons at omega-3, you will have a positive here, uh, a positive uh, sign for the population at omega-3. But now, if you say, OK, I consider, I, I, I want to calculate the derivative of the total number of photons. OK, so I, I take this. And I obtain psi divided by 2 h bar. It's not zero, but it's not surprising, obviously. We are right. Yes. No conservation of the photon number, obviously. If we come back to these simple uh, pictures here, in the case of a photon fusion, for example, omega-1 and omega-2 give omega-3. If you make uh, uh, the... the Delta N, the difference between uh, the number of photons at the exit of the crystal and at the entrance of the crystal, you have here delta N equal minus 1. And if, if you consider the, the reverse process, the scission, you have delta N equal plus 1. So you, you, obviously, you, you see that, but probably you know that, we don't have conservation of the number of photons, but sometimes it can have... Uh, important uh, consequence, and idem, obviously, for uh, for wave uh, interactions. So conservation of the total intensity and no conservation of the total number of uh, photons. If you have 100% uh, of conversion efficiency uh, for a second harmonic generation experiment, you will have half of photons than at the beginning. <coughs> OK, so now we can move uh, at the sixth part. So b refringent phase matching and quasi-phase matching. But for quasi-phase matching, it will be just an introduction to the talk uh, that will be given by Marty Feyer uh, tomorrow. Um, so let's begin with the, the, the case of out-of-phase matching. Uh, so in that case, so it out of, phase match, out of phase matching means delta k different from zero. It means, so if, if you, you, we take this vectorial picture, so we consider that we have a collinear interaction. It can be not collinear, but, but here I take collinear interaction for simplicity. And so it means that there is a delta k here, so meaning that k3 is not equal to k1 plus k2. OK, so now if you consider here the, uh, the, the coupled equations for the real uh, amplitude, um, and if delta k, because delta k is equal uh, to uh, 0, we see that along the propagation of the wave, so z starts from 0, and, and then uh, z increases. <coughs> So you see here that we will have a periodical change in sign of the amplitudes of the free interacting waves. And so you see that very well if you consider this. Obviously, you will have a change of sign because z is going to increase, so delta k is fixed, delta phi is fixed. And so obviously, as a function of z, you will have a change of sign of these differentials, obviously. And uh, so if we uh, take the simple uh, case uh, of this, so, uh, which is the undepleted uh, pump uh, approximation, uh, so we consider here, for example, the case of a sum frequency generation. Omega 1 plus omega 2 gives, uh, give uh, omega 3. And uh, we consider that, in fact, the uh, efficiency is very low so that we can consider that uh, we can uh, neglect the uh, evolution of E as a function of Z, that we have obviously to consider which is rel uh, relative to uh, omega-3. So it's very easy uh, to integrate this equation. So we obtain this here. So we have the electric field at omega-3, the generated electric field, 
as a function of z, and knowing this, you will have time this night to, to make these calculations. You, uh, after the bar step, obviously, uh, you will have, uh, you will have, you have here the generated, uh, the generated uh, intensity uh, as a function of uh, z, and obviously we see here that we have periodicity, but obviously because we have trigonometric functions written uh, before, so it's normal that at the level of the intensity we uh, we find uh, trigonometric functions and so periodic functions, and uh, we we see here. So if we plot this i3 as a function of z, we have this square uh, evolution here, and the periodicity here, we have a periodicity of 2LC, where LC uh, is uh, pi over delta K, is which we call the coherence length. So it's not the coherence uh, length uh, in the sense of uh, the coherence of light, it's a coherence length of the parametric process. Uh, and it means that you see here that you have generation of omega-3 from omega-1 and omega-2, so you have an increasing of I3. And after LC, you have a decreasing, so it means that you have the reverse process. So omega-1, omega-3 uh, splits into omega-1 and omega-2 and, uh, and so on. So you can calculate easily uh, the coherence length if you know the refractive indices, if you know the Selmayer equations. And typically, LC is range, ranges between one micron to 100 microns, so around one micron in the visible part and 100 micron in the far infrared or mid infrared uh, part. So here it's not really interesting because you built and you, uh, you kill, you build, you kill, and so on, so it's not really interesting. So if you are here, you are a little bit happy. If you are here, you are not happy. But here, yes, you are happy, but not uh, so much, because this length is very small. So you have built something over 10 microns, so it's not, it's not great, in fact. Okay, so now if same equation, but now plot as a function of delta k z over uh, over uh, two, and so here, so you have this. So here you have this nice square function. So we write. So it is classically written. Uh, 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 by this, because we are interested in uh, in the value of the function close to delta k equal uh, delta k equal zero, and so what we see here, so we see that so it's the same function than previously, uh, as a function of delta k z over two. So imagine you are at uh, z position in the crystal and you have a way to vary delta k. You can vary delta k, as Bob uh, said this morning, by changing the temperature, for example. You can also change the angle of propagation. So, because now you know crystal optics, so you know that the refractive index change as a function of the position. Okay, so you can vary delta k. So if you do that, so it can be at the exit of the nonlinear crystal. If you do that, you see here that you have a maximum efficiency at delta k equal uh, zero. And this situation is called phase matching because it corresponds to, if it's delta k equal zero, you have phase matched between the nonlinear polarization at omega three and the field which is radiated by this nonlinear polarization at omega three it's in phase, and so maximal uh, interference level, and so maximal conversion efficiency. So phase matching 
is here, delta k equal to zero. So in that case, uh, k3 is equal to k1 plus k2. One more time, I wrote here the coupled equations written for the real uh, amplitude. And so delta k is equal to zero. So you have here delta phi, uh, the proportionality with sin delta phi. What you see here when z, so you propagate the field, so z is increasing, no change in sign. So here you have the real amplitude. And if we, we had a change of sign, because we have a function of z in the argument of the, of the scene. So here you see no dependence with z. So no change in sign. So it's a, it's a first point. And what you see also here, it depends, it is proportional to sin delta phi. And so you know very well your trigonometry. And you know that for delta phi equal plus or minus pi over 2 sinus phi, the modulus of, sinus, of uh, sinus phi will be equal to 1. And so maximal, uh, the optimal situation from that point of view. We know that with that, uh, this, uh, um, this uh, uh, phase uh, relation, we will have maximal amplitude for the three derivative. And so now let's, let's see what, what is the implication of that if we consider, for example, a phase-matched photon fusion. And so here, maybe what time is it? Yes. Um, OK. And so uh, here, so it is the, 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 the photonic scheme of a photon uh, fusion. And so you have the phase phi 1, the phase uh, phi 2. And so what, what is the phase of phi 3? We saw in the previous equations that the optimal situation will be a, uh, a delta phi equal to, so in that case, yes, OK, a delta phi equal to plus pi over 2 will exactly correspond to, to this. Because if you have dA1 over z negative, dA2 over z negative, and dA3 over z positive, so it means that you are in this situation. You have, uh, okay, you have collapse, so you, you are going to decrease the population of photons at omega 1 and omega 2, and you are going to increase the population at uh, omega 3. Uh, so, what we will have here, naturally, you will have a phase adaptation here. So I am going to make a comment on that. And so the phase at omega 3 is equal to pi over 2 plus phi 1 plus phi 2. But it can look like a miracle. How can I fix this phase? Because, OK, omega 1 is at phi 1. Omega 2 has a phase phi 2. Why I will have that? In fact, it is done by nature. You can, you, you, you can keep in mind uh, this algorithm. So at the very early step of the interaction, you can generate the, the field at omega-3 with, I don't know, uh, you have all the spectrum of phases that can be generated. But what we know according to uh, these, these equations, the previous equations, we know that we will have a maximization of the interaction for the case where delta phi is equal to plus pi over 2. So it is obvious that very rapidly the main, uh, the, so it, it, it is set at the very beginning of the crystal, you will have this setting of the phase at delta phi equal pi over 2. 
So the stronger situation uh, win, wins, in fact. You can also see that if you consider uh, that it is an inf interference uh, interaction. Okay, and so I am uh, finishing uh, this first part, and so we will uh, uh, see meet this afternoon for the second part of the, of the talk. Thank you very much.